Uh, if you guys have your Bibles with you this morning, and I hope you do, you can go ahead and open them to the book of Matthew. And we're going to be in chapter 2 this morning, continuing on in our series we're calling The Advent of the King. This is our Christmas series. And um, as you are turning there, if you have a Bible with you, you can go ahead and open it. You can uh, download a Bible app. We also have some Bibles out on the table. It's a gift to you. Merry Christmas. If you don't have one, grab one on your way out and turn to Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. While you're turning there, let me ask you this question. You ever have this experience? Um, maybe you're driving to work or to the grocery store or to a friend's house. Some kind of drive you've done a million times, right? And uh, you pull up into the driveway, into the parking lot, wherever, and you sort of come to life again. And you realize, like, wait a minute, like, I just did a half hour, 15 minute, however long drive, and I was barely conscious that I was even driving. Like, you couldn't tell me a single thing. I don't remember a single thing about the drive, but I just made it. I could have run a red light. I was like, I was not even there, right? All right, some of you guys are not bad drivers. Let me ask you this, though, all right? Have you ever watched a movie or a TV show or something and you bought maybe a bag of popcorn or a, like a bowl of chips or ice cream or something, right? And you're like, you know, I'm just gonna have a couple bites. I'm just gonna, you know, I'm just gonna have a little and enjoy this while I'm watching this, right? Well, the movie ends or you get to, you know, the 14th episode of your show and you look down and all of a sudden you've eaten everything and you're like, I didn't even know. When did this happen? I was just on autopilot. I was barely conscious of this, and yet it was happening the whole time. No? Okay. All right. We got a lot of good drivers and uh, good eaters. All right. Let me ask you this then. Have you ever been maybe walking somewhere, and at the same time you're trying to text somebody something, right? And for whatever reason, maybe it's a confusing text, or they're not getting it, or you're trying to word it correctly, right? And you're just engrossed in your phone. And before you know it, you know, you've texted back and forth like seven times, right? And you get to where you're going and you don't know anything about what happened, right? You just were completely engrossed in this text and everything else was just kind of on autopilot. No, maybe? Okay, all right, let me give you one last one to set the stage. We just had some, uh, some friends of ours come and visit. And it was interesting because we, uh, where we live, we live right by a fire station, a gun range, and two major airports, right? So there's a little bit of external noise going around. Now the funny thing is though, is once you've been there about, you know, a little, uh, about a year, you just kind of get used to it all. It's just, you know, it, it's certainly happening and you certainly hear it, but you don't factor it. Maybe if you've lived by like train tracks or maybe you're by the airport too and you've experienced this as well. And so friends show up and they're like, wow, how do you get used to that noise? And you're like, what are you, oh, the airplanes? Yeah, it's nothing, right? Well, here's the deal. There's another noise that we're all experiencing right now. And, and this noise um, comes from Christmas. Christmas is the most anticipated, most celebrated, most advertised, most commercialized holiday all year long. And so for you and I, you've probably already seen your fair share of Christmas cards, Christmas carols, Christmas lights, Christmas parties, Christmas, 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 right? And it can become all together sort of background noise. We can become indifferent to it. We, in fact, we can come to despise it. And so my question to you this morning is, how will you respond to the truth of Christmas this year? And I want to work us through the text with three responses we see in our main characters. All of you will probably be from, you don't even have to come from a church background to be familiar with this story. This is the story of the wise men, the magi. And there's three characters in the story. I want to highlight the way they respond to the truth of Christmas. The first is, how will you respond to the truth of Christmas? The first is with the hostility of Herod. The second is with the indifference of the scribes. And then the third is with the worship of the wise men. How will we respond to Christmas this year? Let me start with our first character, with the hostility of Herod. So if you have your Bibles with you, we'll get started. Matthew 2, verse 1. It says this, now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of King Herod, after Jesus was born, okay? So if you're thinking manger and sheep and shepherds, then we need to move forward a bit, right? So the old joke amongst pastors is that in the nativity scene, you have the wise men right there with you, but really you need to move them down the hallway a ways because they probably don't get there till maybe two, three years later. Jesus isn't a baby, he's a toddler. And you see in this text, it says, now after Jesus was born. And notice it says, in the days of King Herod. So this is a historical marker. 
Herod the king reigned between 37 BC and 4 AD. But don't just hear this as like, okay, that's an interesting historical fact. What I need you to get is the tonality of the story, all right? It says, now in the days of King Herod. And what's interesting, we'll get into the theme of Herod's hostility, but the historical King Herod was a tyrant. And it's, this would be the equivalent for us of saying, now in the days of Hitler's Germany, right? There's a, there's a foreboding, there's a darkness, a, a frightening, menacing sort of sinisterness about this. And the story continues. It says, behold, wise men came from the east to Jerusalem. Behold, check this out. Here's something fascinating. Now, who is the most unlikely person to be part of the Christmas story? Believe it or not, it's these guys, these wise men. Uh, what's interesting is that when it says wise men from the east, we're probably referring to modern day um, Iraq or Iran. Um, this would have been ancient Babylon. And these would have been, by all accounts, to God's people who Matthew is writing to, these would have been considered the bad guys, right? These are the guys that we don't like. And all of a sudden, they show up in the story. These would have been the most likely rich, wealthy, well-educated Babylonian pagans. These are uh, astrologers slash astronomers. So think like pagan priests slash, you know, scientists, right? It's, there's no real equivalent. But this is an interesting group of folks to show up in the story. This is the Oxford professor slash the, uh, the pagan priest. And Matthew's writing and saying, look who's coming to Christmas. Look who is coming to Christmas. Not the homeschool kids that grew up in the church, but the really spiritual goth kids. With the Ouija boards and the dream catchers and the charm bracelets and all the reasons why Christianity is false. They're the ones that are showing up. They're the ones that are responding. They're the ones that are responding to the truth of Christmas. So they show up in Jerusalem following the star and they have an immediate question. And everyone's asking where, you know, you know, and by the way, real quick, just, you know, in your thinking and in your mind, you're probably picturing, oh, the three wise men, right? The three wise men. There's three gifts. There's three wise men. It never says that anywhere in the text. Chances are if they're bringing all of these expensive gifts and if they're traveling that far and if they're as wealthy and well-educated as we think, they're probably bringing a whole group of people with them, right? There may be many, 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 many of them. Because we see they have an impact when they show up in Jerusalem. And Jerusalem was a large enough city that three people, even from far away, even wealthy, may go unnoticed. So this is a huge caravan of people. They come in, and people are like, what are they doing here? What is going on? And they have this question. Where is he who was, has been born king of the Jews? They evidently say this question potentially to Herod's face. Now, Herod, as we already discussed, is a bit of a tyrant. And one thing that you do not want to do to a ruthless dictator is, uh, and, and this guy has had his wife and his sons killed. This guy is men just menacing and maniacal. He will do whatever he can to maintain power. He's incredibly insecure. He is a, a puppet king. And the last thing you want to tell to somebody like that with a track record like that is, hey, where's the real king at? We came to see the real king. Right? It would be the equivalent, and if you're like, oh, that's, that's funny, but I, I can't connect with it. Imagine someone comes up to your house, someone comes into my house, and they're like, hey, Kyle, where's, where's the real husband at? Where's the real dad? Whoa, whoa, wait a second. I'm the real husband. I'm the real dad. What are you talking about? So Herod is deeply offended, and you could just imagine Herod's eyes starting to twitch at this news. What? The, what? And notice when they say he was born king of the Jews. He's not going to become a king. He's already the king. And they say, for we saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. Now, the star is kind of an interesting player in the story. And a lot of scholars will go all the way back to the book of Numbers, 20, uh, chapter 24, verse 17, where prophecy is made about the people of God. So there's this Messiah who's coming. There's this prophesied one who will crush the head of the serpent, who will be a blessing to the nations, who will reign on the throne of David. And part of that is they say this in Numbers 24, 17, a star shall come out of Jacob, that's the people of God, and a scepter, that is a king, shall rise out of Israel. Imagine, if you will, some of you guys are really excited about that new Lion King movie, right? All the parallels are right there. He lifts up the baby and everyone exalts. That's kind of the, the image that he's getting. There's going to be a star and there's this king that is coming. Now, the word star in the Greek is the word, oh, I'm going to butcher this, but here we go, 
apogasama, apogasama, which means uh, brightness, radiance, um, shining. So this is descriptive language, not necessarily astronomical data. And this is a whole rabbit hole we won't even get into this morning. Some people think the star is natural, it's a comet, it's a supernova, it's a planet. Some think the star is angelic as a marker of Jesus. Um, I would probably land on the line, I think the star is supernatural. And the reason I do is because it seems to move, appear, disappear, be localized. And it also picks up on a theme throughout the scriptures, wherever God is showing up in redemptive glory, there's usually, it's marked by fire and light and smoke. It's the glory of God made manifest. So think like Exodus 13, where God led the people out of Egypt by cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night. Think 2 Chronicles 7, 1 through 3, where they had just built the new temple, and all of a sudden God's presence, unique, manifest glory fills the temple with fire. So here's the point. The star is a symbol that God wants all people, regardless of language, regardless of culture, regardless of nationality, to come to Jesus, to look to Jesus. He is the Savior of the world. And so what's interesting, and I want to just allegorize this for one second, okay? It'll preach. Just let me allegorize it. You're never supposed to, but here we go, okay? So if you are a follower of Jesus, and it is the Christmas season, I want you to see that you can be that star in somebody else's life. You can point them to Jesus. You can lead them to Jesus. You can answer their questions. You can invite them to church. You can invite them out for coffee. You can invite them to your community group. You can speak about the goodness and the grace and the mercy and the forgiveness of God. You may very well be the means by which God saves, regenerates, and moves the hearts of others. You might be the star in their life this Christmas season. Don't miss the opportunity. If you're not a Christian here this morning, or you're checking it out, or maybe you grew up in the church, but you're not really sure where you fall, what I would want to highlight for you in the star is that what we see is that Jesus is doing something very significant. He is overcoming every cultural barrier imaginable. Christianity, you need to know this, is not a white, middle-class, suburban religion. Jesus is for everyone, and the star demonstrates that. You might be here to say and say, you know what, Uh, I'm not like you. I don't have your background. I didn't grow up in the same way. You don't know what I've done, where I've been, uh, who my family is, what, what my past is like. And I would say, you know what, that's that Jesus welcomes everyone anywhere who will respond in faith. Who will respond in faith. This is not a country club. I don't proclaim the gospel of middle class white suburbia. Christianity is an Eastern religion. Christianity is the fastest growing religion in the world. Christianity is finding the most success in the global South. Anyone and everyone who will come to Jesus is welcome. So, let's talk about Herod. If we're going to hear the truth of Christmas, how are we going to respond? I want us as a church to have a really built-out theology and practice of response. It is so important. Verse 3. We're going to linger here for a second. It says, When Herod the king heard of this, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. I think Herod is very helpful for us because oftentimes non-Christians understand the meaning of and the implications of Christmas better than believers, better than people who've grown up in the church, better than people who just think Christmas is just the noise that you hear at this time of year. Many will say, well, Christmas, you know, it's a sweet time of year. We buy gifts. We watch the movie Elf. We drink hot cocoa. We laugh a little bit. We have some traditions. I don't know why everyone's getting so angry about the Christmas tree down at the courthouse. I don't know why it's such a big deal. Christmas is, catch this, inherently political because if Jesus is king that means he is the authority he is the ultimate boss a king demands and deserves our highest allegiance that's why in countries like North Korea the supreme leader doesn't allow Christianity because it's competition because it's competition Christmas is about the coronation of the global king He has supremacy over all rulers, all kings, all governments, all nations, all people. Do you understand 
why people would respond to Christmas with the hostility of Herod. It's interesting because in Seattle, uh, most people will be like, yeah, you know, Christmas, sweet baby Jesus, eh, whatever, right? But what's interesting is that Seattle is one of the most progressive, secular cities in the country. Secular would be life without God, life absent of God. Doesn't matter. That's my definition for secular. And what's interesting is that even though we live in a very secular city and we know our coworkers, maybe our family members, our neighbors, right? They, they have this mentality of and, and mindset that is very secular. I want you guys to see something that secular thinking is inherently religious. Stick with me one second. I read a book by Dan McAdams. It was called The Redemptive Self. The Redemptive Self. He makes the argument that... Um, that most of sort of like progressive secularism in the United States is actually heavily influenced by Christianity. Heavily influenced by Christianity. And so it has a Christian shape to it, even if they don't recognize Jesus as the king. It's also deeply moral, even if they don't tend to see it. So how does it follow the contours of the Christian faith? And why would that lead to a hostility at Christmas? Let me give you some examples. First is that in a secular mindset, there is an Eden. There is an original intention, a created design, an unfallen, unashamed world. And for the secular mindset, this would be the inner self, the inner child, your true self, who you really are. So you'll hear people say like, you know what, I just got to go, I just got to go out, I got to go camping, I got to get in touch with my true self, who I really am. I got to get back to that original thing. Secular mindset also has this understanding of a fall. If what it means to really be human is to self-actualize and to bring out your inner child and your inner self, then the fall is any binding commitment outside of ourselves. The fall is adulthood. The fall is responsibility. The fall is tradition. The fall is authority, and so on and so forth. Secular mindset also has an understanding of sin. If we are the greatest good, self-actualizing as the greatest good, and the universe exists for our fulfillment, then sin is anything that constrains our personal happiness and pleasure. Sin is anything, any external binding commitments. So what does salvation look like? The Christian would say salvation is by faith alone and Christ alone who lived the perfect life we couldn't, died the death we deserve, filled us with the Holy Spirit and gave us the promise of life everlasting. But in a secular mindset, salvation is discovering who you truly are. It's accepting and celebrating your inner and true self. That's what it means to cast off the restraints of society, to cast off the restraints of your culture, to cast off the restraints of the church and the Bible and God, and to be who you think you truly are. It's a different view of salvation. And then finally, it's a different view of holiness and maturity. Whereas in the Christian worldview, in the Christian mindset, the understanding of salvation is it's both here and not yet, if we're working, we are denying ourselves, we're following after Jesus, we're discovering a new way to be human, we're growing more like him each day, in the secular mindset, holiness and maturity is the opposite. It's getting more in touch with ourselves, so it's avoiding commitments. It's accepting and celebrating ourselves. It's finding those things that bring us a sense of happiness, but the problem is happiness is always fleeting. The problem is happiness has a million different definitions. We need something more tangible, more real, more lasting, more binding than mere happiness. We need meaning. We need purpose. And that has to happen outside of ourselves. So the big problem for Herod, and it could be a big problem for us too, we don't get to be the boss. That's the good news of Christmas. Christmas is good news to those that are hostile to faith. Jesus is king, and that's not an arbitrary authority. It's an unbelievably beautiful and freeing truth. Because, and I've said this before, and I'll just do it again. Let's get real for a second. If we're going to get real, let's talk about us. The truth is that when it comes to us, no one has ever given us more trouble than ourselves. No one has ever been more terrible to us than ourselves. No one has ever lied to us more than us. No one has ever failed us more than us. We're often terrible to ourselves. And the irony is that we keep thinking we can fix ourselves. Well, we're the solution. 
We can pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. We can climb back onto the throne of our lives. We can regain rulership if we just try harder and do better. Perhaps the problem isn't trying harder and doing better. Perhaps the problem is getting off the throne in the first place. Perhaps the problem is the hostility that we have, whether we recognize it or not, towards God. He is the uncreated creator. You did not decide to be born. He made you. You were made for him and from him and to him. And until you put him in the middle of your life, everything will always be disoriented. Your loves will be disordered. The alignment of your life will be off. You were made from God for God. And here's the good news. Christmas and the truth of Christmas breaks us out of the tyranny of ourselves. Jesus is king and Christmas is about recognizing and worshiping the eternal God. He knows more than us. He's wiser than us. He's, <laughs> he's infinitely glorious and good. And he loves us. He loves us enough to rescue us from ourselves. So perhaps you don't respond with hostility like Herod. Perhaps you feel more just indifference like the scribes. Our next characters. Point number two, how do you respond to the truth of Christmas? Perhaps it is with the indifference of the scribes. Now, Herod is going to call in another group of folks. He hears about a king, the coming Messiah. He calls in the scribes. Scribes, not a term we use. Not a term we use now. Scribes are basically your pastors, your seminary professors, your Bible study leaders, your scholars and theologians. Look what it says in verse 4. And assembling the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. And they told him, so they know. These guys know the scriptures, they see the star, and they're not doing anything about it. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for it is written by the prophet, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Yeah, I know exactly where the verses are. I know exactly how to find it in my Bible. What's fascinating to me is that there are those, and maybe you've met them, maybe you are one. There are some people, whether it be a college professor or somebody off the streets, there are people who know the scriptures front and back better than I could ever hope to, but it makes no difference in their life. There is an indifference there. They haven't responded they haven't worshipped. They're apparently not going to go with the wise men. Look what it says in verse 7. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly, ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And when he sent them to Bethlehem, he said, Go, search diligently for the child. When you found him, bring me word that I too may go and worship him. Right? You know, you know Herod is full of it. But notice that neither Herod nor the religious professionals would go and search for Jesus. They know about him, but they do not know him. They understand him, but they do not love him. They recognize his authority, but they don't respond to it. These are the religious experts. They should be the first ones to Jesus. But their response to the truth of Christmas is indifference. And perhaps, and I hope you don't hear me just like throwing stones and over caricaturizing. I want to pick up on themes, because perhaps this is you this year. Maybe you just feel a little indifferent. Eh, what does it matter? I, 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 you know, this is the 35th Christmas for me. Maybe it's the 60th for you. Maybe it's the 27th, whatever. But there's this point of like, we've done this before. And maybe you struggle with feeling a little bit indifferent. I want to give you maybe three reasons in my observations and conversations with folks why you might feel a sense of indifference this Christmas. The first is, maybe if you're honest, Jesus hasn't met your expectations. He's talking with someone... Um, a year or two ago, and they said this thing that has always stuck in my brain. They said, I was pleading with them. I was explaining faith. I was trying to lift up Jesus, and they told me, they said, Kyle, you know what? I tried church. I went there once. It didn't work for me. It didn't work for me. Perhaps you're indifferent to Christmas this year because Jesus didn't meet your expectations. I thought in following him, I would be happy, healthy, wealthy, successful, and my life would fall into place. I thought I could go to church on occasion and get the meaning that I need, kind of check off the spiritual box in my life. 
perhaps, perhaps, you may be feeling indifferent to Christmas because you do not fully understand what is being communicated in Christmas. Jesus doesn't want to be a part of your life. He wants all of your life. Jesus doesn't want your Sunday. He wants your Monday through Sunday. Jesus demands our full allegiance. And in the same way, you wouldn't go to the gym one time and expect to come out ripped and muscular and healthy. Don't go to church and think that you're going to somehow get your spiritual mark checked off. Jesus says that if you love me, you'll do what I command you to. They'll know you're my disciples by the way you love one another. Pick up your cross daily. Die to yourself and follow me. The Christian life is all-encompassing. Perhaps you're feeling indifferent to Christmas because, well, if you're honest, and maybe you wouldn't say this out loud, but you feel it internally, Jesus just seems totally irrelevant, right? Like, this is just, it's kind of almost escapism. It's a nice story, but what does it have anything to do with me and my life? And what's interesting is that I would say if that, if you feel like Jesus is totally irrelevant, there's two things that you perhaps might be lacking this Christmas. The first is perhaps you're lacking an understanding of who Jesus is and what he's come to do. In Jesus and in the truth of Christmas, we have meaning, morality, purpose, destiny. This is all-encompassing. This isn't just for life in the future and what happens when you die. It's for your life now. He's your rabbi and your teacher. He's opening up a new way to be human. Christianity is far from irrelevant when we rightly understand it. Well, perhaps you're feeling indifferent because if you're honest, there's just a lack of communion. Like, you understand what Christianity is and what it means, but you just don't spend a whole lot of time with God. And if that's you, I want to encourage you in something really practical this morning. There's a great book called Spiritual Pathways in which the author... um, outlines nine ways that we connect with God. There's a test online. I'd encourage you, if you're part of a community group, um, have your folks fill this out and have a discussion about this. If you're not part of a community group, get in one. And, um, and I encourage you, take this test. So here are, the, here are the nine ways that we connect with God. As you're hearing these, I wonder if you might identify which one you are. And we're all really a combination of several of these things. So how do we connect with God? How do we commune with God? How do we develop intimacy with God? It's different for many of us, for all of us. Let me give you some ways. First, there's the naturalists. The naturalists. These are people that love to get outdoors, that love to go hiking, that love to see the sound or Mount Rainier. And by seeing the majesty of God's creation, it helps them to connect with God. It helps them to pray. It provokes them to praise and to worship. For some, perhaps you're not a naturalist. Perhaps you are an intellectual. You love theology. You love books. You love to learn new ideas, new concepts, new realities about who God is. And if you're not learning, you feel a disconnect. That's how you uniquely engage with God. Perhaps you are... Um, A sensei, you love the arts. Perhaps you're a traditionalist. You love ceremony and schedule and ritual and symbol. Perhaps you are an activist. You love and you feel connected and close and provoked to worship when you're fighting for justice in this world. Perhaps you're a caregiver and you feel closest to God when you are loving and serving those who are in need, those who are broken, those who are hurting, those who are addicted, those who are the least of us. Perhaps you feel most like Jesus when you are serving them. Perhaps you're an enthusiast. You just love worship, right? You're just pumping the worship tunes in your car, going to work. You're listening on your headphones on the bus. You're just rocking out. You're an enthusiast and you feel closest to God when you are worshiping him. Perhaps you're contemplative. And for you, a pathway to commune with God is to get away from people to get alone, to get quiet, to get some silence and solitude. Maybe you love to journal. You love to go on prayer walks. Know your spiritual pathway. If you're feeling indifferent at Christmas time, may I contend with you that you commune with God in the unique way that he made you. Then maybe the last reason you might be feeling indifferent is you just already know everything about Christmas, right? Oh, come on, the wise men. I've heard this story a million times, right? But look at the example of the scribes. There's a difference between knowing and exalting. 
There's a difference between understanding and praising. There's a difference between knowledge and worship. If Christmas is boring to you, if the church is stale, if the Bible seems dry, if you're going through a low point and you feel sort of indifferent to the whole thing, then might I contend with you that it is time to take the next step of obedience in your faith. Challenge for you practically today, if you're feeling indifferent to Christmas, take the next step of obedience. The next step that makes you feel profoundly uncomfortable. The next step that God has been calling you to, but you've been procrastinating. Maybe it's getting involved in a community group. Maybe it's serving in one of our teams. Maybe it's opening up with another brother or sister about some sin that you've been keeping hidden. Maybe it's just asking for prayer after the service. Maybe it's inviting out someone for lunch. If you are feeling indifferent to the truth of Christmas, take the next bold step of obedience. Because when you are partnering with God, when you are walking with Him, every day can be fresh. Every truth can be relevant. Every word can be effective. Take the next step of obedience. If you are feeling like God is simply a set of facts to learn, if you're feeling like God is simply theology to understand or an academic field of study, I would encourage you, be cautioned by the example of the scribes. Because they would rather be comfortable than go and worship Jesus. They would rather have ideas about Jesus than go and worship him. They would rather talk about Jesus than go and worship him. They would rather fit Jesus neatly into their corner of their life than to go and worship him. A lot of people know about Jesus, but they don't know Jesus. So the question then is, how will you respond this Christmas? Back to our wise men. Back to our wise men. We don't want to fall into the trap of religious indifference. We want to go and worship Jesus. The wise men responded with worship. So let's not respond with the hostility of Herod or the indifference of the scribes. Let's respond with the worship of the wise men, which looks like this. They worship by lifting their voices, bending their knees, bringing their gifts, and obeying their king. Verse 9 says this, After listening to the king, that is Herod, they, that is the wise men, went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, check this, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. I love that phrase. To the max, absolutely. My, my daughter drew me a picture the other day, and it said, uh, Ellie, heart, 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 daddy. And I said, oh, Ellie loves daddy. She said, no, daddy. Ellie loves, 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 daddy. That's the kind of super rejoicing that they are doing here. And the reason I want to highlight this is because as a church here at RVC, I really, really, really want us to have a built out theology and practice of response. We can do that this Christmas. When God initiates, when God speaks, when we hear his word, when we receive a message, when we listen to a sermon, when we sing songs, when we hear the goodness and the grace and the truth of God, what do we do? We respond. And there's many ways we can do that. Look what they did with joy. They responded with great joy. They lifted their voices. They interacted. Church isn't just a download of information. It's a community of worship. So they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. When God shows up, when God speaks, we celebrate. They rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. Well, what if I'm introverted? Rejoice exceedingly with great joy. Well, what if I can't sing? Rejoice exceedingly with great joy. Well, what if I'm a loner and I like to sit in the back and I like to leave when the songs start? Rejoice exceedingly with great joy. Well, what if I'm not expressive and I tend to be pretty, you know, just to rejoice exceedingly with great joy. Well, what if I'm a bearded hipster and I'm only into indie rock and I'm too cool for everything, right? Rejoice exceedingly with great joy. It's not about you, it's about him. God shows up, God intervenes, God rescues, and we respond with celebrating. We respond with celebrating. Following their example, it says, going into the house, they saw the child with, his, uh, with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshiped him. We respond by bending the knee to our king. 
And it's interesting because I want you guys to get the mental picture at this point. Jesus is a toddler around two years old. Here are these Oxford professors, these wise men, these PhDs, bowing before a toddler with a snotty nose. They're worshiping. And they're becoming Christians that night. They move from worshiping the stars and the planets and the environment and themselves to worshiping their king. For some of you, maybe the step you need to take this Christmas is to bend the knee, maybe even for the first time, and to see Jesus as who he truly is, the king of the universe. And then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Many of you will be familiar with this. So these are gifts that you give to a king. The gold would be kingly. The frankincense is, um, would be burnt and offered up in prayer and consecration, showing Jesus' priestly role. And then the myrrh would be used as burial perfume. So even in his birth, it's already highlighting his death. And what's interesting is that we see that the magi, the wise men, they worship not merely in understanding or in thought, but they brought their gifts. And there's something about when we give that we really start to understand and practice the gospel. Yeah, and I, I can tell my, my givers, my tithers out there, they're already like nodding their heads yes, and I can tell who's not. Like, oh gosh, is he going to talk about giving? What is this? But the truth is, 90% with God's blessing is greater than 100% without it. We don't give gifts to God like royal care packages. We don't give gifts to God as bribes. We don't give gifts to earn favor. We give sacrificial gifts as a way of ascribing worth to God. We give our treasures to God in the work of his kingdom because he is worth it. And then one final way that they worship. Thank you for sticking with me. Verse 12, it says, And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. The wise men have a final choice. They obey Herod or they obey God. Part of worship is obedience to Jesus. And so the principle here is that we always respect and submit to our governing authorities unless they either command what God forbids or forbid what God commands. And perhaps you saw the news this last week, Pastor Wing Yi um, and over 100 members of Early Rain Covenant Church in China had been arrested by the state for subversion. Before he was arrested, he wrote this powerful letter that perhaps you've seen floating around online. He said, as a pastor of a Christian church, I have my own understanding based on the Bible about righteous order and good government. And I'm filled with anger and disgust at the persecution of the church by the communist regime, at the wickedness of their depriving people of their freedoms and of their conscience. As a pastor, my firm belief in the gospel, my teaching, my rebuking of all evil proceeds from Christ's command and lordship. Every man's life is extremely short, and God fervently commands the church to lead and to call everyone to repentance. Christ is eager and willing to forgive all who turn from their sins. This is the goal of all of the efforts that we have done in China, to testify to the world about our Christ to testify to the middle kingdom about the kingdom of heaven, to testify to the earthly momentary leaders about the heavenly and eternal leader. As a pastor, my disobedience to the communist regime is part of my gospel commission. Christ's great commission requires of us great disobedience. And the goal of disobedience is not to change the world, but to testify about another world. We respond to the truth of Christmas with worship because the king has come. And tyrants of the world ought to tremble because the king has come and his kingdom is breaking into every nation, every time zone, every people, every culture, every country. There is no closed nation, no dictator, no supreme leader, no false religion that will thwart this growing kingdom. How will you and I respond this morning? I want to invite the band up and I want to encourage you this morning. You've heard the message. What are you going to do about it? Perhaps you need to lift your voices for the first time, and you need to rejoice exceedingly and with great joy. Perhaps for some of you, you need to bend the knee for the first time. You need to cross the line of faith. You need to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. 
You need to confess your sins. You need to receive his forgiveness. And you need to experience a new life. Perhaps for some of you, it's bringing your gifts to God. Perhaps you have been blessed. Perhaps you haven't. But we give because he is worthy. Because his kingdom is good. And because we want to advance his mission. And perhaps for some of you, this morning, your act of worship is obeying his command. Perhaps it's not listening to what the culture says, what the world says about life, about sexuality, about religion. Perhaps it's practicing a disobedience to the world that is an obedience to the Lord Jesus. How will you respond this morning? Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you for the truth of Christmas. We thank you, Lord, that as the people waited and waited and waited for 400 years, Lord, that you came, that you fulfilled your promises, that you love us. Lord, may the truth of Christmas warm our cold, indifferent hearts. May the truth of Christmas turn enemies into friends, turn agnostics into followers, turn hostility into love. God, we love you. May we respond now in worship. We pray this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.